the first real job I had in this country was, I think I've talked a little bit about that. My ambition when I came to America was really I wanted to become a movie director. That was my ambition at the time. Uh, my father, who had lived in California, to wit, in Beverly Hills, where he had a friend, and that was really the first place where he lived in the U.S., said, and he had friends there, so he, he could probably have, you know, gotten me some sort of, you know, menial, some little transition there. He said, I don't want you to go to California. You get the wrong impression of what the United States is all about. He did not like Hollywood, Beverly Hills. Uh, he enjoyed the climate, but he used to quote Fred Allen, the great comedian, who when asked about California said, it's great if you're an orange. <laughs> So that was nipped in the bud, more or less. But my father had friends here who were involved in filmmaking, albeit it was of a documentary nature. One friend of his had been an editor for G.W. Pabst, who was a great German director during the silent era and into sound. Uh, his name was Paul Falkenberg. And uh, so there were people, the other thing was that, uh, you know, I wanted to write also. So, but there was something called the March of Time. And that was a weekly kind of, it wasn't, maybe it wasn't every week, maybe it was a monthly thing, but it was kind of newsreel based, but it had a single topic. They made some jazz things. They did a thing when the original Dixieland Jazz Band was reunited. And they did something else on 52nd Street, which has some great Art Chatham snippet. But all the outtakes exist. So you hear him play the same thing over and over again. Nightlife Boom is what it's called. Something yeah, Nightlife like Boom. That's yeah. right. That's 1947 right. or something. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, my father knew somebody at Time Inc. So he, you know, he, I went there for an interview with a guy at the March of Time and he sat me down, he was a very nice man, and he said, you know, he listened to me for a while and I didn't think of it, I was pretty, you know, into the film thing. He said, you know, he said, there's something called television. Now we're dealing with uh, late 1947. He said, there's something called television and that's going to do away with the march of time and a lot of other things. And of course, he was absolutely right. So he said, why don't you, you know, you're also interested in journalism. So he sent me downstairs <laughs> the march of time was up in the Time Life building in Rockefeller Center. Uh, and uh, I got a job as a trainee, which was really a glorified messenger job but it had its interesting aspects. And my boss was a guy named Gordon Clark. He was what we call a black Irishman. Uh, he had been to Oberlin, uh, but was kicked out of there because <laughs> in a somewhat in, in inebriated state, he had gotten a hold of a ladder and put it up against the girl's dorm because he, he had a girlfriend who climbed up and he actually managed. He didn't fall down, but he was caught by security <laughs> and he was thrown out. Uh, he was, uh, I, I have no idea what happened to Gordon. It, it's been, what, 50 years since I've seen or heard of him. But the reason why I bring him up, uh, he was a sharp guy and he, he had uh, many facets, but uh, Unfortunately, uh, he was quite a drinker, but I shouldn't say unfortunately because he taught me to drink and, uh, you know, and I had beer and wine before, but he taught me to drink the hard stuff, but he was very good at it, at teaching me in the right way. 
But anyway, we used to go out a lot together, and he liked jazz, and uh, we'd go out, and uh, he introduced me to Jimmy Ryan's, actually, he just uh, and And, uh, but where we mainly would go, we would hang in the village, and that was, again, my introduction to that particular place, where I had a lifelong <laughs> relationship with the village, but it was a place called San Remo. San Remo was an Italian restaurant with a big bar. And the bar was at that time, we're talking 1947, 48, uh, was a hangout for writers and actors and people. You know, it was a very popular hang for a fairly interesting clientele. And Gordon, especially after he'd had a few drinks, was a very outgoing guy, and he was well-spoken and obviously intelligent. He wasn't a bore or anything like that. He introduced me to some very nice girls, but he also introduced me to James Baldwin, who had not yet really been discovered, but who was one of the few black people there and whom he had, I guess, I don't know, but uh, become friendly with. Anyway, Gordon, of course, knew by then that my father was a writer who actually had the first volume of a trilogy that he wrote published in English right about that time. It's called The Son of the Lost Son, and it's about the area where he was born, which then was Austro-Hungarian Empire, then became Poland, and now is Ukraine. Uh, and it's about many things, but it's really mainly, it's a lot about the relationship between Jews and the Polish and Ukrainian population there in the countryside. Not a shtetl. My father was born not in a shtetl, but in a village. His father was an overseer for a big uh, farming operation owned by a Polish noble lady. He was a chassid, but that's what he was doing for a living. That's what he was into. He had very good relations with that lady who, when my father got to be a certain age, he introduced him to, to that lady. But anyway, that was my father grew up in a village, not in a shtetl. So, well, to make a long story short, the novel deals with that, with a Viennese uh, Jew, young, young man, not, not an adolescent, but a young man who has really drifted away from Judaism and Judaism, who decides that he wants to go back to where his father was from and to, you know, have a look at that. He's impressed with something that happens in Vienna. It's a Zionist Congress that happens there. So that's what it's about. And uh, when Gordon introduced me to Jimmy, he mentioned that book and so on. And he said, you know, we talked for a while. And as I maybe mentioned before, in my relations at that time with African Americans, as we now say, which was not known then, uh, the fact that I was from Europe made me more interesting and more quickly accepted without in some way having to demonstrate that I was not some kind of prejudiced MF, you know, that. <laughs> so, uh, and he was interested in it, so I, I got him a copy of it anyway, so he was interested in it because it deals in a way, you know, this young man rediscovers his roots and that's also something that Jimmy it was within his, you know, spectrum. Anyway, we became friendly, and that's too many when I also 
I had gotten friendly with Lonnie Levister, I think I mentioned him, and uh, uh, that was, you know, uh, somebody that Jimmy knew too. They much later became involved together in a what they wanted to be a Broadway musical, but it didn't work out. It was called Kicks and Company. It almost made it, it would have made a huge difference to my friend Lonnie if that had come about. But this was another reinforcement of my acquaintance with uh, Jimmy Baldwin, who was interested in jazz, uh, had a brother who was a jazz piano player who died young, apparently, from OD. He wrote a short story about him. Okay, what was it called? Sonny's Blues. Sonny's Blues. I never somebody. So we kind of, you know, we we, we kind of hit it off. I mean, you know, uh, Jimmy was uh, very interesting. Needless to say, he <laughs> was interesting. Uh, and we thought so, you know, we talked about jazz, which he didn't have a very close relationship with, but he liked certain things about it. I played him some Louis, he came to, came to my house and uh, I played some Louis for him, uh, uh, <laughs> including some, in, these Louis things that come from a different period, but are, you know, songs that deal with blackness, and may seem off-putting at that time to them, like Little Joe and Snowball and so on. But he was interested in that because, you know, that's to do it. Ralph Ellison understood these things, I think, a little better. It was, you know, Jimmy didn't exactly <laughs> embrace it, and I don't blame him for that. Uh, anyway, we became friendly, uh, and with Lonnie getting involved with with him uh, with this project, uh, we you know we saw quite a bit of each other. Uh, but uh, then came the time he had a sister, Gloria, who worked for this big. Uh, black uh, magazine, which was kind of an imitation of life. Uh, there was Jet and Ebony. Ebony was it. She worked for Ebony. So she had a press thing for Newport when it was still in Newport. And uh, she brought Jimmy there. And I was the only person there that he knew, you know. I mean, we were part of the press thing, which wasn't that big, you know, there was a press tent. Around. So we saw each other almost immediately. And uh, so since I was his only acquaintance there, when I think we, we hung together for, you know, for the weekend. And that's when Louis played and, you know, we listened to Louis together, and it was a beautiful evening where one of those evenings when there is no wind, it's almost, but it, it's in Newport and it wasn't hot or humid or anything. And when the air is like that, you know, music carries beautifully. It almost, you know, it gives it a kind of glow and with Louis's tone, you know, so Louis played an extraordinary set, and I could tell that you know Jimmy really responded to that. But then I, I have quoted this, but then Louis ended in this right now, as we are talking, is all this stuff with the athletes kneeling and the national anthem. I hate that tune and the words. It's really bad poetry and bad music. It's unsingable, you know what I mean? It's so rangy that even a professional singer would have trouble with it. And everybody who sings it at athletic events murders it. And then you get, like at, 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 at hockey games, you get O Canada, which is beautiful, beautiful melody. And it's not about war. It's a terrible poem by that guy, John, what's his name, Keyes. And most recently, a New York Times columnist discovered, he printed the third stanza of it. Did you see that? Yes. 
So the guy was a, he was a, he was a rebel and he was prejudiced. He was a racist. They should do away with it. And that it would be a wonderful thing if this whole thing would lead to doing away with it and substituting America the beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, Louis was the one guy, I mean, it, it fits a trumpet much better than it does a vocal. So he would always end with the anthem, and for very good reason, because people always wanted more, and that particular night they kept wanting more. So Louis finally had enough, so he played it, and by then it was almost like, almost two o'clock in the morning, one thirty or something. And aside from what was going on there, of course, it was completely still. No, you know, no traffic noises, no ship's horns or anything. And he played that. He, the band was doing very little but to give rhythm support and a little what we call organ background. So the trumpet really stood out and Louis sounded that was so great, you know. You could almost in spite of the fact that you don't like the two. It fits a trumpet better than a vocalist. Anyway, when it was over, Jimmy turned to me and he said, you know, that's the first time I've liked that song. So, uh, he was a very nice, personable guy, you know, uh, very warm not at all pretentious in any way, and uh, good company. And of course this was, he wasn't famous yet, it was just the beginning. He had had a Rosenwald Fellowship and uh, been, to, been to Paris, I think. Uh, we might <laughs> make note of the fact that that was a, a Jewish sponsored fellowship. When he was in Paris, I don't know, I don't know what he was writing. I think he was writing The Fire Next Time, and he said he was listening to Bessie Smith on a portable phonograph writing that, yeah. and that doesn't well, surprise me. That, yeah, yeah. Did you ever cross paths with him later when he became Famous. When he became famous, I did cross paths with him once, which was, I believe, it was at a reading, he did, maybe at a Barnes and Noble, you know, they have those readings when he had a new book out. And uh, I, you know, I said, oh, well, there were a lot of people, you know, I've got to line up and want the book autographed and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, this was years that I hadn't seen him, but uh, he remembered me and I said, you know, I'm glad you talked to me now that you're famous. <laughs> and he laughed, you know. Uh, he was, he was, uh, you know, I mean, he, 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 he was a nice person. He didn't have any side or anything like that. You know? And the fact that he was gay, I mean, it was, without any significance in that. Yeah. Thank you.